Every boss in Lodran dies in this video. Starting with Asylum Demon. Hello there, Seraph from 17 once again. This is Dark Souls. Soul level 1, new game plus 7, no roll, no damage. We're starting with the first boss of the game, the introductory guy, the wonder that is the demon that guards your first steps into the journey of this magnificent game. And I'm going to be walking around doing actually no sprint as well for this one because, as you can tell, he's quite basic. I'll be using the Morning Star just because you don't really see this weapon getting used at all. It's just essentially a club with some bleed on it. And this is played on the PC on the Dark Souls remastered version of the game. It's going to be an interesting run. I'd really like to record Elden Ring right now, but the game's still stuttering. Like nine months after it came out, the joys. So instead of being able to do the project that I want to do, I thought I'd come back and do a nostalgia project from my favourite game in the series. See the souls for my for the New Game Plus 7 verification. Technically New Game Plus 6 is when the game stops scaling, but um, thanks to Emaril, everybody likes New Game Plus 7 better, right? But I was using Tearstone and the Dusk Ring, and now we're moving on to Taurus Demon, which one of the best looking bosses in the game that doesn't really have much to do because you find him on a tiny bridge. And the archers before this were murdered, and because I was quitting out guys to do the retries whenever I got hit, what happens when you quit out in Souls is it keeps the instance, so the archers stayed dead. So if you're wondering why they're not shooting at me and I didn't run over there and go climb the ladder to kill them, it's because of that. But this is a, a fun project first and function second. But Taurus Demon is... He's got some pretty interesting hitboxes. Some of this stuff should not touch you and absolutely does. Some of it should touch you and absolutely doesn't. And I wish you could fight him in a proper arena like you do in the Demon Ruins. But as it stands, it's more of a spacing game and not getting backed into a wall because he pushes you around because of the way the geometry works and the collision. And it turns it into a whiff punishing simulator. And there's a jump attack, you can go through his legs on that one, which is one of the coolest no roll dodges that you can do with him. And if you can get him to fall off, you, you earn a cookie. But I'm using a hand axe here, which is the Pyromancer starting weapon. And it's kind of interesting in this game because it doesn't do as much damage as a lot of the clubs and things that you can use because it swings faster. And Dark Souls 1 definitely looked into the idea of how fast something swings to how big the damage calculation will be. Uh, and you'll notice a lot of the clubs, a lot of those blunt weapons, they have a very slow swing and, and quite a lot of punishment for missing. But the damage that you do is, is, is large. And this axe swings for days really quickly and does reduce damage because of that. But I wanted to use it just for diversity, just for some variation. And there goes Taurus Demon. I cursed myself before doing this so I could have the awesome icon in the corner. And I put the dust ring on just so that I could really reduce the HP to make it look kind of funny. But there are the stats. And this is what I'm equipped. You'll have to excuse me going into the menus. The buttons are different from Elden Ring and it's been a while since I played Dark Souls. But moving swiftly on to the Bell Gargoyles. Absolutely phenomenal fight, this one. One of my favourite ganks in the franchise. It's incredibly fair in so many ways, but it's quite dangerous to get into it. Because <laughs> he likes to jump at the start, and you have to be real careful in some of those hits. But I was quite surprised by how how good the hitboxes were in this game. And I know you're probably thinking, Chris, is this the same Chris that shit on Dark Souls hitboxes for a decade? Yes, it is. And they're terrible, don't you? Don't you even believe me for a second? But some of the hitboxes on the gargoyles were way better than I remembered. And you can get away with murder on some of these moves. And it just goes to show how elegant From can be at times. And how goddamn terrible they can be at other times. And we will be lamenting a lot of that. But the gargoyles are weak against lightning. So bringing out the giant blacksmith's hammer is, is the old staple for a sequence like this. And we're going to be whacking them. Technically... So a decent amount of these fights are no rings, because the rings I'm using aren't working. But I didn't want to put that in the title, because the titles get too long then and too stupid. But I'll, I'll tell you if there's any variation, and you'll be able to see it yourself. And once again, I show the stats guys, and you'll see the souls, and if you go to the wikis, you can see how many souls you get for the higher New Game Pluses, and you can verify that it is indeed New Game Plus 7. But Capra Demon, this is a nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Doing this without the Thief Ring is, is like a slot machine waiting to hit a jackpot. And there's almost nothing cool about this fight other than this. 
If you stay close to this move, you can step under both swings, and if you hit him three times, you'll stun him. And that's all you really need to know. If you want to do this under in, in increased difficult stipulations, this fight becomes very tedious. But people do it, because people are crazy, and I love them for it, but I have no love for, for Capra Demon. I think it's a horrible design decision in every conceivable way. And Quilag is the complete opposite. I love this fight. And she has a boatload of HP too. So at this moment I was reminiscing with the good old giant blacksmith hammer. And I wasn't testing any of the crystal weapons or any of the other choices that you can use here. But I just figured that using the, the chaos reinforced club would not be the best choice here. Because I don't think you can bleed her either. Many of the bosses in Dark Souls 1 are quite resilient to bleed if not immune. So what this fight becomes, because she does have quite a lot of HP, is it turns into... Uh, a positional advantage fight where she's going to throw out a lot of area of denial and you're going to do your best to kind of walk around it and see what you can do and as you can see from the video here there are a lot of moves that she does where you can simply just go around them because the hitboxes are very very good unfortunately the one downside of these hitboxes is in spite of all the moves seemingly being quite fair and quite honest to what they visually look like when she dodges she hurts you and there are a few bosses in this game that do this and I, I just disagree with it on a fundamental level, it really frustrates me. Because they don't do full damage, they don't hurt you a lot, but they do chip damage, and it's enough damage to lead to a lot of resets. And Quilag is really bad for that, because if at any time she decides to dodge when you're near her, you will oftentimes not be able to do anything about it, and you'll just take a little bit of damage. And Sif is by far the worst contender for this issue, and it's, it's just one of those things where I would have liked the remaster to go in and tweak things like that, because these are not attacks. It's not a move meant to damage you. It's just the consequence of, of, of two hitbox and hurtbox coming together and a, a slight chemical reaction happening there. Because one of the cool things about this game is when you do get hit in Dark Souls 1, especially when you're not wearing a lot of poise, even though the CPU goes through your poise and eats it like a monster anyway. Like when you get hit in this game, your character tells you that. You know, you see the reaction. You, a lot of the times, you get knocked down. You know, you, you, you hear a noise. There are tons of wonderful signifiers that you took damage and you were hit. And these are your punishments. And especially in Dark Souls 1, when you come back to it, a much slower game, all of this feels like it takes an eternity. It feels like you are, you are getting hit. And it doesn't do that on the, on the jumping moves, on the dodging moves. It just does this white effect on your body. And that tells you that there was damage there. And a lot of the times, you might not even see it on the bar, but if you look into your stats, you'll notice that you took you took a point or two of damage. And especially in a fight like this where the boss has a, a lot of HP, so you're fighting for a decent amount of time, kiting the room, trying to make sure you don't put yourself against the wall with the lava. And a lot of the times, you might take a hit and not even realize. And that's the worst kind of no damage fight, because you're not getting hit by the boss, you're getting hit by bad design. There goes Quilag. One of my favourite bosses in this game, coming back to it. It's really nice to come back to a game that I adore and to look at it with fresh eyes and see how it's aged and how, how it's changed and what I remember and what I what I don't remember even more so. But we now move into the derivatives of the Asylum Demon. This is mandatory damage, this guys. When you fall into this room, you will take a percentage of your HP and uh, there's nothing you can do about it unless you go and start messing around with rings. And because it's technically not the fight, I'm not going to count it against the no damage here, because it's boss damage, it's not circumstantial damage. I could have put a, a fall damage ring on, and that would have alleviated that, but it's not my intention to, to have issues with the start of the fight rather than the actual fight itself. And I could have just made myself invincible, so I took no damage anyway, you know? There's a million things I could have done to avoid it, but the point is, this is Stray Demon. I'm using the Reinforced Club. I'm going to be doing no sprint on this attempt as well, so we're going to be walking around like a beast. And one of the cool things about the remaster, which you won't hear me say that a lot because I think the remaster is fucking terrible, is that it shows you a visual tell for a lot of this enemy's AoEs. And he didn't have that in the original game. It was just particle effects, and a lot of the times you get hit from a mile away. But with this, you get a nice understanding of, of, of what is happening with this particular ground slam. And if you've ever got hit by a lingering hitbox against this enemy, you'll know that there are times when it feels like the, the move has ended, and yet you're still taking damage. And Dark Souls 1 is the master of hitting you with bullshit like that. And once again, this was an opportunity for the remaster to go in there and clean this up. But they didn't. And on the list of the things that they broke that were really, really cool, 
offshoots of mechanics, you know, incorporating each other. They go in and they keep this garbage. I just I just don't understand. You you remove dead angles with your incompetence, but you don't remove lingering shitty hitboxes. It's just not cool. But there goes the stray demon. He's a cream puff, especially if you use any kind of bleed. And then there's the statistics. Once again, not using rings and not using sprint on that particular fight. Nothing too impressive. They're very basic. And then we have one of my favorite bosses in the run. Uh, Mr. Gaping Dragon. I call him Mr. because I respect him a lot. Uh, this fight is, without a doubt, the most Dark Souls fight in this game, I think. Because it is a boss that looks incredibly intimidating and it's uh, amazingly designed. And then the moveset for it is diverse enough to be unique, but very much a fight about strategy and tactics. And that to me is what Dark Souls 1 is all about. It's about choosing when to attack. It's about seeing what the enemy is doing and respecting it enough to circumvent it and then go in there and see what you can do about it. And it's got a good room. It doesn't really have any massive, you know, there, there aren't any flags here. There's no red flags of things that I absolutely hate about it. Of course, if you don't set the fight up correctly, you will have a channel of firing at you and you, he'll buff the boss and things and that can get a bit troublesome. But there's a lot of dynamics going on here. Everything the boss does is fair. Most of the hitboxes are okay. I'm not a big fan of being hit by him moving when he's technically not touching you. And there, there's a couple of weird instances of, of oddities, but you can break his tail and get a unique weapon. You can hit his face and get some seemingly some bonus damage. He's got jumps. It's just, it's quintessential Dark Souls. And we, we didn't really get bosses like this ever again, which I think is a, a real sadness. Because the thing that I love about Dark Souls and Demon Souls is it's very chess-like. Your opponent takes their turn, they can do something wonderful, they can do something intricate, and then it's your turn. Then there's almost no instances where that's not the case, outside of some very unique situations. And it turns it into this... It's a patient game and a placement game, and it's more about position than it is about reaction. And I love that. I love knowledge and positioning being powerful and being respected and rewarded. And what happened with the Artorius of the Abyss DLC is that was the beginning of the end. That was the death of the conventional Dark Souls, Demon Souls boss. And what happened was the bosses got more intricate and more interesting and objectively more difficult, but they also got less meticulous, you know? They, they got less... they got less deliberate. And with that, this unique event that the bosses were turned into actual bosses. Straight up rivals, where you go into a boss room and the boss is incredibly capable and gets faster and faster and faster on each new game and has more hits and more hits and more hits and more hits. And then we get to Elden Ring, where there's almost no true indicator that it's your turn in that game because they just keep swinging and they keep swinging and when they stop you go up to them and you press a button and they input read and they swing again and it's just it turns it into this 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 like anime fighting game and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that if you like that you know that's that's one direction to go but the the thing that I didn't appreciate until much later with Souls games because I came from Devil May Cry and I came from Ninja Gaiden and God of War and, and those kind of super fast action games. I always wanted faster Souls games. And when I got them, I came to really appreciate what these games were. And they were so different because they forced me to play in a manner that I would have normally not played in. And now we have Sif, which is a fucking nightmare. I despised recording this fight. I don't like this boss at all, and you'll notice it's the first boss in the run where I'm using the Tearstone Ring. And this has nothing to do with how difficult Sif is. Sif is actually very easy. The problem is, every time he does that, whenever he jumps like that, if he's anywhere near you, it hurts you. And he can jump twice in a row if he wants to. And most people will fight Sif by going underneath him and just utilizing the fact he can't hit you when you're below him. Well, guess what, guys? When you're doing no damage and he dodges like that, if you're beneath him, he hits you. So you spend all of this fight trying to figure out a time where he won't cheesily hop away and do chip damage to you like a cunt. And it's just not fun. It's ironic because I quite like playing the mid game when I do no roll. I'm not a big fan of being constantly aggro on the bosses and them not being able to move. It looks awesome and it can be fun to do, but my style is more about seeing the move, avoiding the move, punishing the move and finding cool ways to work with it. 
I want to show you what the bosses can do. I want to show you move sets. I don't necessarily want to exploit one move and continually get them to do it and just loop them because as cool as that is, it's not as fun for me. So I like to play the middle range, which is what I'm doing with Sif. But nobody plays mid range against Sif because it's a stupid idea. This boss's weakness is beneath him. But if you don't know damage, the moment he dodges, you fucked. So this fight should have been two to three attempts at most on the recording. And I think I was here for like two hours. And it's it's really irritating when you lose to something that has nothing to do with the fight. And it, it just... I really, really, really dislike that they did that. And I don't know if it's a mistake, I don't know if it's intentional. There are a lot of bosses in this game that do jumps that don't hurt you. There are a lot of bosses in this game that do movement and positional stuff where they don't hurt you. And then there are ones that do. Like that slam just then, why did his feet not hit me? His feet don't hurt me on that slam, but his sword does because that's a good hitbox. Yet when he jumps, his feet hurt me. What is the difference? It's an evasion. He's literally evading. He's not attacking. Why is he getting hitboxes? Why is he even active? All of these questions that just make me think that they roll a fucking dice in From Software from absolute trash tier to seemingly decent. And, and then we have to suffer. And most people will beat these bosses once and then tell the friends that they're a Triple Souls veteran and they won't have to worry about it. But you come back and you do something like that and it's just, it's miserable. And speaking of miserable, the worst fight in the run. The Moonlight Butterfly. So not only do I have the Tear Stone ring on for this one, but you'll notice I also have the Grass Crest Shield, and I think I might even be using the Chloranthi ring, because if you want to know about pain and tedium and just absolute garbage, welcome to this encounter. So on this difficulty, the Moonlight Butterfly will attack you about 8 to 10 times, depending on your luck, and then when it does come down, you need to kill it, because if you don't, you're fucked, because you have to keep doing this. And doing this is a nightmare, trust me. And it's one of those fights where if you get lucky, you'll do it in one attempt. If you don't get lucky, you might be here for hours. But the problem is, when it comes down to rest, it's random whether or not it stays there long enough to let you kill it unless you super optimize your damage. <laughs> so if you get really unfortunate, this boss will just fuck off before you've killed it. And if you're not using range, which if you're doing a run like this, you won't be using range because it's kind of the spirit of the run. Like, what do you do? You have to dodge moves that are incredibly difficult to dodge. And, and just kind of put up with this, and it's it's just a big RNG fest. And the strat that I'm using here, guys, is I just try and move with him. I, f I mirror his direction, and then I pray. And I, I tense my asshole, and that's it. And then when he comes down, it's time to kill it. And, and it doesn't look like much, but this was one of the hardest fights in the run. And it's it's terrible. It's terrible, it's miserable. I don't know what they were thinking. Absolute utter garbage. Never doing it again. But there he was, there was Moonlight Butterfly. We took him out. Oh, I was using Havel Ring, not Chloranthi, my bad. And I popped a Blossom to get right in there and do some damage, but fuck that boss. Terrible. Casually, you don't even remember it, do you? Well, here's Iron Golem. This guy is probably one of the first bosses, if you're new to the series, where you might use no roll just by sheer virtue of fighting this boss. Is, is Positioning is really strong, so you can simply just kind of get under him and work the spaces. But there's a couple of things to bear in mind, because this is the highest scaling of the difficulty on the New Game Plus cycles. This guy has a lot of, shall we say, poise for this game, even though it didn't really have a name, did it, in this. Although there are people that want you to believe that Sekiro invented posture-breaking bosses, even though you're going to see me posture-break this boss in this video, like eight years before Sekiro even existed. But the idea is, hit his ankles enough, and uh, he'll get the Tower Knight treatment where he'll fall down. Another posture break of a boss before Sekiro existed. So take that, Triple Souls veterans. And if you hit him enough, he will go from this stunned state into a fallen state. And then if you get lucky, depending on his positioning, he might even fall off Sense Fortress. But I didn't get lucky. I'm using the, the Great Battle Axe here. Oh, the Battle Axe, is it called? This thing is awesome. This is one of those weapons that I always knew was strong, but I never really thought about using it on level 1 until I did a bunch of Elden Ring stuff, and I had a, a lot of fun with this exact weapon in Elden Ring. So when I came back to Dark Souls, I wanted to see what its R2 was, because what you notice with a lot of the viable weapons at level 1, they have a jumping R2. And jumping R2s are great for doing many things, but they're not so great when you need to stay bang where you are, you know, because it's a positional move. 
Whereas this thing does a big overhand slam and it hurts too. And the thing that I like about this axe more so than the R2 slam is that its R1 is quite fast and it's horizontal. So you can use this to hit some things that are quite difficult to hit when you use the clubs. And it leads it to being one of my favorite level one weapons now that I would have never used at level one. Because back in the day, uh, I would have just used the blacksmith hammer or the reinforced club. But he's got a lot of HP if you don't use the tear stone ring. As you can see, it's just, it's more tedious than anything else. I would have definitely liked to have seen the iron golem in a different place with more tools but the same kind of concept, because I think he's one of those bosses where if you put him in Dark Souls 3, he'd be really cool. He'd be jumping around, wouldn't he, and doing all kinds of weird shit. He'd like pull a sword out halfway through or something. He could be super awesome. And he still stands as one of the better bosses in this game conceptually, but mechanically, he is stay between his balls and don't get grabbed. And then we have this fight, which is just odd. So I was really worried about this in the run, guys, because I had no idea how I was going to fight an invisible boss. And this was a first attempt. And you should see how much of a clusterfuck this is. I come in the room, right, and I bump into her. I say it was a first attempt. I whacked her to trigger the fight. I quit out. I came back in. So I walk into her. I'm looking for the footprints. And I'm just thinking to myself, what am I going to do with this? How do I dodge something I can't really see? And, and most of the time when you fight Priscilla, you just kind of kill her, don't you, with a Black Knight Albert or something. So I do a jump attack, and she doesn't punish me. And she swings over there, so she's somewhere in that vicinity. So I do another jump attack to see what goes on. And I just think, I'll swing, and I, I think I get a stun or something. And I just walk around her, kind of whacking. And she's got no HP, and I just, I don't know, guys. This is the main issue, I think, when you come back to Dark Souls, when it comes to the bosses. For every boss that you have that's, that's like Quilag, where it's got this interesting dance of positioning and spacing and things, you have Priscilla, who is narratively probably quite fascinating you know she's she's a waifu she's she's all cute you can not kill her if you don't want to who kills her you know i ain't killed her in years but when you do fight her the gimmick is she's invisible and that's it but this is the one that you were all waiting for ornstein and smo the the father the grandfather of every gank fight in elden ring and I'm going to be pulling out all the stops on this one because this is an incredibly difficult fight for several reasons. The worst of which is I do not like it. There is a lot of cool stuff you can do with Arnstein and Smo here, especially if you play really aggressive, but I just don't have the will to do this fight like that. And I ended up doing this fight on stream as well to show people what it was like. And I think I, I struggled on the first phase for about an hour and a half. And then as soon as I got to the second phase, I won. Like, it just goes to show what you're dealing with. It's, you need to respect the shit out of this fight and be as aggressive as you can. And I'm going to be killing Ornstein first and then going for Smo. And there's, there's just a couple of things that happen in this encounter that make it really frustrating and tedious. The, the first of which is the tendency for the bosses to sync up and put themselves into places where you can't really do much. You can kite them a bit better than I'm doing, obviously, and there's a lot of exploitations you can do if you've, if you've mastered the fight. But I just, I like to bait Ornstein into overextending and then punish him before Smo gets too close. And then when he goes down, we're going to go in and start fighting the, the big daddy himself, the, the Super Smo. Super Smo is kind of interesting, actually. I I never really liked this, this part of the fight casually back in the day. Because to me, it's just, you use the pillar, don't you, to stop him from doing that charge that's got a horrendous hitbox. But... A lot of his moves when you're close to him can't really hit you if you know what you're doing. So that, that horizontal slam he just did, you can just stand near his left knee and it won't touch you. And if he does the overhead slam, you can walk behind him. This one's the bad one. This has a massive lingering hitbox. It's it's just miserable and, and poorly designed. But if you hit small, I think it's th this is another one. If you stand in the right place, it can't hit you either. If you hit him three times, he flinches. And when he flinches, it gives you enough time to walk away from him. So you want to try and get into the habit of that if you can. But if he pulls out that jumping move and you whiff, you will not have enough time to get away. I lost a run on that exact happenstance and it's just, it's not my favourite occurrence. There's his overhead. Uh, can we flinch him? No, so what's happening here is, every time he would be flinched, he's, he's backdashing. And because he's backdashing, he's getting infinite poise. The player gets infinite poise when you backdash as well. 
uh, which is really interesting in this game. I say backdash, it's a, it's a backstep, isn't it? But there goes on scene and small. I'd love to tell you that I enjoyed doing it, guys, and that it was a really fun experience, but I don't find much enjoyment from that fight, personally. It's just not for me. And I pulled out the tier stone range to make it a bit quicker. If you don't do that with tier stone range, you might be there for about five to seven minutes, depending on how aggressive you are. It can definitely be done. There's many people who've done it, uh, but I will not be on that list. And then we have Ceaseless Discharge. This was an interesting one, this, guys, because you can simply use the, the in interesting death technique on this dude and make him kill himself. But I wanted to actually fight him, and from doing this recording, I can pretty much confirm that you shouldn't do this. Ceaseless Discharge is the most interesting looking thing in this game. And when you look into what he does, like when he tears his own arm off to attack you and stuff, when you think about how tragic this character is, how tortured he is and tormented, like this is such an interesting thing. But the moveset is so lame. He's got like two swings, he's got this horizontal thing, and he's got his lava move, and then he's got his like slam lava move, and it just... He repeatedly does the same thing, for seemingly no reason. You can try and manipulate him, but sometimes he'll just do the wrong thing. And then every so often, you think you're going to get something cool, and he, and he just does a different variation of the same thing. And this took two attempts to get this, but it wasn't fun. And when I come back and do these projects, guys, I'm not doing this to impress you. You, you know, if, if you want to be impressed, you're in the wrong place, you know, go... Go watch a doctor save lives or something, you know, go watch some 24 hours in A&E, see some real heroes. But I, I do these because I want to challenge myself, I want to have fun, and I want to bring something interesting to the channel. And I was really hoping I could find something cool here and show you something you might not have seen or, or do something that might have surprised you. And it just, there's just nothing to be done, is there really? I, admittedly, I didn't search on YouTube to see if anybody figured out something really cool and, and awesome about this boss. Sometimes you find that. People figure out so many cool things. Like the strategy that I use for the better chaos in this run. I initially wasn't going to do the better chaos because, you know, shit boss is shit. Fuck that boss. But I decided to do it for posterity. And I used a, I'm assuming it's a speedrunner technique where you, you use a bow to throw some firebombs and then you just walk to the thing and you, you deal with it. And it's, it's incredibly effective and, and the person that came up with that strategy is, is incredibly clever, if you ask me. It's, it's the kind of thing that... I suppose the internet would call it galaxy brain, wouldn't they? They call it like smooth brain or whatever. I would just call it, that to me is mastery. That to me is precision. It's it's a showcase of, of, of a fundamental understanding that goes way above the cause, doesn't it? It's so high to, to just learn to do that and to figure out the exact positioning for it. And that's what makes the speedrunning communities. And I don't actually know who, who found that strat. So I, I apologize if I'm giving credit to the wrong people, but whoever that player was, that thought, I'm going to try and make this as pain-free as possible. I'm going to really dig deep in here and data mine the shit out of this fight. That guy was ahead of his time, and he's a damn hero to people that want to skip better chaos. Because you don't have to quit out. You don't have to instance him or anything like that. You have to be careful, though, because sometimes he still does Firestorm when you're on the on the branch going towards the, the actual parasite. But, like, that is an interesting way to kill Bed of Chaos. And when you well, if you've not seen it, you're in for a treat, you know, because it's cool as hell. Whereas... Even if you've never seen somebody fight Ceaseless, like I'm fighting him, that wasn't cool as hell. <laughs> you know? And for such a, a giant, a monolith in this story and in this game, a game that has some really interesting looking bosses that don't play so good, he definitely takes the cake. That man is a devourer of confections. And we did it no rings, technically. I think we were sprinting, so there was just standard no roll on that dude. And then we get Demon Fire Sage, which is the, the final of the Asylum Demon reskins. The, the prototype for Elden Ring before Elden Ring existed. And at the start here, this guy likes to do this jumping slam. And if you walk towards his right knee, there's no hitbox there. Did you see that? Isn't it interesting that this guy can slam his hand and his staff on a forward hitting move and it doesn't hit me? Yet, those dodges that Quelag did, those dodges that Sif did, that shit hits you for free when they're dodging. Think about that, guys. They're not even wearing the armor of thorns. They're just dodging. And it hurts you. And I actually complained about it on Twitter. And somebody on Twitter defended it. So, if you want to lose faith in humanity, there you go. It took 45 seconds and my, my faith was destroyed. 
but expecting to get any kind of reinforcement for the human race on Twitter is probably the most impossible game to, to ever attempt, you know. I just think Twitter exists to make people look more stupid than they are and and convince me that this wor this 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 race isn't worth saving and aliens will never venture to visit us because we're like the fucking Kardashians to them, aren't we? We're some burning shit fire that they just don't want to go near because it smells too bad. But I learned some interesting things sticking on the Demon Fire Sage in this room. I learned that when you go into the corner and he pressures you in the corner, if he does the butt slam in the corner, it doesn't hit you if you hug that corner. And it should, because its hitbox absolutely would be overlapping you when he does it, but it seems like they give you some kind of grace period if you're stuck against the wall. And I don't know if it's colliding through the wall and missing you or turning itself off because it's touching the wall. Because if you remember, there's certain properties in this game when you swing, where when you hit a wall sometimes, if the swing continues, it doesn't do damage. It's this, it's one of the oddities of, of the Souls games. The bosses, they get to hit you for free when they swing through walls and shit, but when you catch one, it's almost like it turns a property off. And it seems like that's what it's doing for that butt slam, which I don't really understand. But we did him with no sprint and no rings, like a true god, showcasing the mastery of being able to walk around the easiest moveset in the history of video games. I think Bowser's more complicated than that fight, right? And then we have Centipede Demon, which this is going to be interesting. Watch this. I've got this magic ability known as teleportation. Have you seen that before, guys? Has anybody figured out how to do that? The only way to do that is to max out your game time. If you max out your game time by meditating in the Demon Ruins, you unlock a special skill known as teleportation. And it allows you to showcase the Demon Centipede fight so that you're not hugging a wall and being annoyed the whole time by how shit it is. But jokes aside, I did this fight at the doorway and it was miserable. It wasn't fun, it wasn't interesting, the guy did like four moves and that was it. So I decided to use a, a teleport trainer to get to the middle base here to see if it would be a bit better for something to watch instead of just a filler boss. And truth be told, it wasn't much better. The centipede demon is the most interesting looking boss with some really cool mechanics. That has some really shitty hitboxes. And because you're surrounded by lava, there's no real flexibility to do anything too cool. But there's a couple of things I do love about this monster that I want to, to talk about here. And that is the fact that you can break both his arm and his tail and they fall off and become actual creatures. And then later on in the fight, if you give him enough time, he can regenerate them. So this enemy here is the prototype to the limb system in, Blood in Bloodborne. And I think they could have took it a step further. Can you imagine if you severed the body part of a boss and it became another boss? And you know how in Willow, when Willow shocks that, that like creeping monkey creature and then it turns into that weird egg and he kicks it off not thinking about it and then it turns into that two-headed monster I think that that right there could be the coolest thing ever and it reminds me of that that pre-release footage of Dark Souls 3 where the developer said depending on how you fight the bosses changes what the bosses do and they made it out like depending on how you fought the boss would depend on what the boss transformed into and I thought that sounded fucking awesome. And then Dark Souls 3 came out and that was not in the game. <laughs> and this ain't the first time we've seen this either. Because if you remember, in Dark Souls 2, they mentioned it there, didn't they? They mentioned that the bosses were going to have these weird phases where they could do different things and then they never fucking did. And it was just Pursua chased you and uh, Freya turned up in that canyon and that was it. And they made out like the bosses were going to be at any part of the level as if it was going to be ambiguous as hell, which sounded super cool. But here is the better chaos strategy, guys. You do five bricks this way, I think it is. And then you look up with your bow. And if you put your bow right on that branch there, if you throw a bomb, that will hit it. And then you need to turn immediately to the right. And then you need to put your bow on this spot right there and throw a bomb there. And if you do this, you will bomb both of the spots. And all you have to do now is walk forward and break all of the, the pieces of wood. And this boss is actually really shit as you might know, but it's shit for a few reasons you might not know. So I fucked this up a few times, and in order to come back here, I had to start a new game, because this boss saves the instance of you damaging his arms. So you might notice that I'm at a level 1 Pyromancer. This is not even on New Game Plus 7, this, but the boss is technically the same. He doesn't change. So I had to, I had to start a new game to record that one, so I do apologize, but, you know, that's just stupidity is what that is. Fuck that boss. And then we have the greatest boss in the history of bosses, which is Pinwheel. A very strange enemy, this one. 
it duplicates itself and, and tries to overwhelm you with magic, but it doesn't have a lot of HP, and it, it can be pretty much bullied by any weapon. So it's not much of a fight, and it's more of a massacre. And I don't really appreciate that Pinwheel doesn't have any answer for this. He went on to become a joke of the community, and it's such a shame, because he looks great. It's a really cool fight, that. And I was tempted to come in here and let him spawn like five duplications of himself and see if I could dance around them. Because that could have been interesting, but alas, that was a one attempt. I actually forgot to record him, he's so meaningless. I, I came back at the end and recorded him and, and grabbed it and it just... It's, it's one of the weaker fights, that's for sure. And speaking of a weak fight, now we have one of the, the big lords that we have to put in the old lord vessel we have. Good old Grave Lord Nito. And there's a couple of things to say here, guys, other than this fight is shit. You'll notice I'm not being mobbed by skeletons. And the reason I'm not being mobbed by skeletons is because every time you quit out to do this attempt again, because I obviously made mistakes, I'm not a god gamer, like Ray Dimitri, killing the skeletons saves the state of where those skeletons are, and it made it so that they didn't revive. And you might think, well, that sounds like that's not the proper fight, that kind of denigrates the value of this fight. And that's fair if you believe that, I'm, I'm cool with that. But here's the thing. When you drop down, you move to the left, you stand near that stalactite or stalagmite, I forget which one it is, and then they roll into it and they can't touch you, and you do a jump attack with your main weapon to lower their HP, then you do a jump attack with a divine club and you finish them off, and at this point, Nito is still slow walking towards you like an invalid, and unless he does the, the Grave Lord move, which can be dodged by doing a jump attack, it's not a big deal. And I, I'd just like to mention that I learned about dodging the Grave Lord technique using a jump attack from a comment on YouTube. Kind of spoiled it for me, actually, but I never figured out whether or not I was doing it. Because every time Nito screamed and I did the jump attack, the move never came out. And I don't know if that's the dodge and that's what happens when you do a jump attack, it turns it off or something. But what I can tell you is I came to this fight with the expectations of having to learn how to dodge that move and I never saw him do it. And I don't know why. He would scream, I'd jump attack, nothing would happen. And I just assumed you had to wait for the moment when it was coming out, and then when you jump attack, it can't track you or something. But it turns out, seemingly, from what I could see, the move doesn't do anything when you're in a jumping state. But I could be wrong, and I'm certain that somebody might stumble upon this and know way more about it. Uh, I, I came here and got this in 15 minutes, and I had no interest in recording it again, because the fight's terrible. Not only is he a beefy bitch, but he's got... Half of his moveset doesn't hit you. The one big thing he has is this weird AoE that you literally can't do anything to because it's just too dominant and active. And then when you get close enough to him, sometimes his cape tanks hits for him. But he looks awesome, doesn't he? This big old bony coat hanger that's got, you know, Doflamingo's jacket on. Just like, I don't even know what's going on, but I love his cloak. I love how he looks. I love the law. I hate the fight. Like, can you think of a boss that looks this awesome, that is this flaccid? Unbelievably disappointing, isn't it, for one of the main bosses? And it always was. It's just coming back, I kind of just look at it and think, imagine what it could have been. It could have been so good. And there's probably somebody out there that really likes that fight, but the skeletons are the boss. People say it all the time. The skeletons in that fight are harder than Nito, because Nito is just crap. And another crap boss is Seath. So this guy is... This is one of those encounters where I, I I love the idea of Seath. I love this blind, wise dragon dude that sold his own kind away. And he's he's going to try and hit you with all this crazy crystal magic in this crystal cave. Conceptually, this is phenomenal, isn't it? Mechanically, it's anus. Because for some reason, From Software decided to give him hitboxes that aren't visually accurate. Like, look at this bullshit. I should be taking damage now, but I'm not. And then sometimes you do. There are times when the crystals hurt you, there are times when the crystals don't hurt you, and you just kind of sit there scratching your head wondering what the fuck's going on. The biggest threat here is bullshit detection on crystals and the tail. Sometimes when you walk around the side of Seath, if he whips his tail, if you're not sprinting, because I think I did this no sprint, you will almost never be able to get out of the way of it, especially if you're in a bad position. But the strategy is very simple. You go up to Seath after you bait an attack, and he'll do a, a long range move, and then when you go close, you'll hit him a few times, and he'll do a close range move. And you just bait these moves and go in, come out, go in, come out, and that's all you do. And when he pushes you against the wall, you go around the other side, and 
I've been doing this against Seath for 10 years, you know? The, the strategy's never really changed. Because the fight is so boring and so lame, there's not really much you can do. And I'd love to see somebody do something really sick against him. But I just don't think he can. And then you get moments like this, when he looks like he's on a mobility scooter looking for a fucking Walmart. Like, what is he doing? He's so confused. He's a confused dragon. He needs putting out of his misery, right? Luckily, the, the giant blacksmith hammer, which I've been getting some serious mile mileage with, it hits him really hard in tier stone range. You get like 750 damage, I think, which is phenomenal numbers all considered. But this was not a fun fight to record, because it's just not a fun fight to do. And pretty stupidly, when I was practicing it off without recording, I did it one attempt. Isn't that cool, right? Get the fight one attempt, get the god pattern, everything's great. And then when it came to recording it, I think I reset five or six times because he kept giving me shit patterns and I kept getting caught by crystals that shouldn't have touched me but did. But I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles, isn't it? I do like how he looks, though. His, his wings look awesome. Can you imagine if he'd have been a proper fight? With proper moves in a big room. He could have been so interesting, couldn't he? And I just don't think we'll ever see anything like Seath ever again. I just don't think we will. We we get gimmick fights now every so often, but the bosses in the in the, these franchises can and if you think about it, guys, think about how the the most dangerous and most capable boss in the previous game was the archetype for every boss in the next game. As this seems to be the pattern, doesn't it? Think about it, right? Manus, Artorius. They are unique in Dark Souls 1 because they can cancel out of recovery into a move to punish your inputs. They're assholes for it. That's in Elden Ring, that. That's what makes Elden Ring so frustrating. It was invented in this DLC coming up. So you go on to the next game. Dark Souls 2 obviously doesn't count because it's kind of a weird game. But in the next game, everything is like those bosses, you know? They're all faster, they all swing more, they're all more aggressive. And then it just keeps doing it, doesn't it? He keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. What what was the worst boss in that? What went on to be the boss that was the, you know, the default in the next one? And of course the kings would turn up when I want to talk about a tangent. And I have to talk about the kings because this fight is legendary. So back in the old days of No Roll, back in the days of the person who invented it, Tolo, or the first person I saw doing it anyway, this fight was believed to be impossible simply because the king have a move which is a horizontal slash and people thought it was impossible to dodge until some creative players figured out a dodge which is very tight to do by the way but the problem is nobody has figured out what to do I think for the second hit I know I haven't so whenever the king does the horizontal hit if he does the second horizontal hit you will lose and there is almost nothing you can do and it turns this fight into an RNG simulator of you bang your head against it until the king doesn't do the follow-up. And it's this is it here. See this? Right there. If he does the second hit, I lose. And I did this on stream. It took me, I think it took me like an hour and a half, two hours. I forget how long it was. And it was the first time I did it. And then I recorded it and it took me about two to three hours again. The, the problem with this is you, you get so unlucky like, the kings can be really trolly. If this guy decides to give you a bad pattern, another king will turn up. And when another king turns up, they're quite passive until they decide to take part. And if, if they decide to come and whack you, you've lost. Because unless you're a god at managing multiple kings and you've got really good awareness, it becomes very awkward to, 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 to like, min-max between the two and, and micromanage them. But the, the big issue is the, the horizontal move. Whenever he pulls that move out, it's a reset, pretty much. Because the first hit is hard enough to dodge with no roll. You really have to know what you're doing. And it takes a decent amount of practice. And even then, even when you know how to do it, it's still sometimes a toss-up whether or not you're in the right position, unless you're constantly moving towards expecting it. And if you get lucky, you won't see it. And you'll just win, and it'll be cool. If you get unlucky, you'll see it a lot. And I don't remember how many times the king did it in this video, but we've already seen me dodge one of them, and I think this is the final king. There it was there, right there. So he could have just turned the fight off right there, and I would have lost, and all this of this would have been pointless. I think he does it again, coming up in a moment, because I think this king gives me a handful. Or maybe not. Maybe I just kill him. There you go. But that's a lot harder than it looks, that, guys. But it's my favourite fight in Dark Souls 1, no roll. Because if he didn't have that, that horizontal move, it would be consistent and really fun.
it's that horizontal move not having an answer for the second hit that makes it really bad. And he can do it at almost any range as well, which makes it really, really tedious. But this is Gwendolyn. I like this fight a lot. This fight to me is a fight I used to think was terrible. Because it's just a magic spammer that runs away from you and has three moves. But I've gone on to really almost romantically appreciate this fight for what it isn't. And that is everything the bosses became in the future games. This is a Dark Souls fight, this. It's a boss that doesn't have a lot of life. It's a boss that has very telegraphed moves. There's no bullshit here. There's no lies, there's no fake swings, there's no Trojan swings. It's all honest. It is an honest boss that has a pattern that can be manipulated using shields, using rolls, using movement. And it's just a traditional Souls fight. And it's not going to win any awards for design. You know, it's the Mario 64 staircase and some random dude spamming garbage at you. But it, it feels like an event. You know how I managed, how I mentioned, sorry, that the, the gaping dragon is this perfect Souls fight for me now, where it's this super intimidating looking cool design, and then the moveset is deliberate, but still fair and still dangerous if you don't respect it. And it does have a bit of a gimmick with the channeler, but fundamentally it's a very honest fight. And coming back after the later games, after things like Bloodborne, after Dark Souls 3, after Elden Ring, I've really come to appreciate a boss that doesn't have an answer for everything I press. I love the idea of they commit to something, and if you're good enough, you punish them, you know? And you can do this in those later games, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm throwing the later games under the bus. You have to play those games in a very different manner. And I think it worked really well in Bloodborne, I think Bloodborne was the perfect prototype for that because the game just had a much more aggressive tone. Whereas, I feel like Dark Souls was always meant to be kind of slow. This is a pretty slow game. This is more about positioning than it is about reflex. I'm gonna keep saying that, because it's true. The new games, I don't think they are. Even though you can argue you can still use positioning, because you know that's exactly what you do in that game if you do no roll and such. But I do feel like there are a lot of players that could just react to a lot of things and roll through everything and use reflex, whereas in this game, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to try and do that. And what ended up happening then with the franchises, of course, because people got good at reacting and rolling, they made everything intentionally designed to hurt a player who was good at reacting and rolling. And and to me, that's, that's miserable. But that is definitely the tip of an iceberg that I'm gonna go into in another date. And now we have the Lord of Cinder, guys. So, this is Gwyn. Remember Gwyn? Gwyn has a fundamental weakness, and it's not parrying. Parrying is, is way too strong against Gwyn, but Gwyn also has a glass jaw. So if you hit him twice with any of these larger, bluntish weapons, he he stuns, and he, he likes to slowly rotate. And what happens is, if you can catch him in a rotation and do enough damage to stun him, you can keep him in this, this like, perma-loop. But every so often he will swing, and, and Gwyn is... Gwyn's a bastard, dude. He's fast, he's got range, and there's almost nothing cool you can do to him. I couldn't walk around any of the moves, I couldn't sprint around any of the moves, he's just range, speed. He might as well be Elden Ring ten years ago, that dude. And that's why everybody parries him. Because if you don't parry Gwyn, you learn that Gwyn is a nightmare. And I still love him, but mechanically, he is an incredibly unfair boss in a game that is very slow. And he is very fast. And I kind of wish we could be as fast as Gwyn just to deal with some of that shit, but you absolutely cannot. And then you have Sanctuary Guardian, who is my favourite DLC fight. So I have to say this, guys. No roll Dark Souls 1 up to this point. The big hurdles were Moon Knight Butterfly, Capra Demon, Ornstein and Smo and the Kings. Ornstein and Smo was just kind of a, a waiting game. So was the Kings. Capra Demon was just frustrating and stupid. And Moonlight Butterfly was just miserable. However, you could probably do every other fight in maybe one to two attempts, depending on your experience with this, depending on how well you know the bosses. Because they're very fun, and they're quite basic. I say very fun, they're not necessarily very fun, but they're, you know, they're fine. They're absolutely fine. I love them because I love this game. The DLC is not like that. <laughs> this is where shit gets serious, dude. This is 50 times harder than everything you've seen. And that is the only fight that you'll probably enjoy, unless you really like this kind of design. The bosses coming up 
are programmed to punish your punishers. And because of that, it changes how you fight. It changes how you approach them. And Artorius, I would love to tell you that I enjoyed this fight, but I fucking didn't. This was utter dog shit in every conceivable way. I do not like this match at all. And it's not because it's too hard, and it's not because I'm a scrub, and it's not because of insert reasons. It's because this boss fucking cheats. This boss cheats, dude. And here, here's how it works. You see me do that jumping move just then? Whenever I do that jump attack, guys, I want you to roll a dice, right? When you roll that dice, if you roll anything but six, you restart. That's what this fight is, right? And the only way to circumvent it is by doing running R1s with really good spacing. Because what happens with Artorius is if he doesn't roll away when you attack him, he can do any number of recovery moves that you might not be able to get away from. And then he has these moves that are just so ridiculous that if you go to attack him, he cancels into these wonderful fucking flipping massive rangy bullshit moves. And it's a nightmare. So instead of being aggressive, instead of staying close, instead of kicking his ass, you have to run away from him. And you have to pray that he doesn't bullshit you on every fucking swing. And it turns it into this. You control the mid-ground, you wait for these moves, and then you punish them once, and then you run away. Or unless you know the strategies that I'm using in this video and you do a little bit more. Like the strategy here where if you delay your punish, you do more damage to him because he loses his debuff. He loses his defense buff, sorry. But this is going to look like an easy fight. And I can guarantee that it's not. This fight took me about, I think, two to three hours, and I hated it. And I was really upset because I wanted to love it too. But the amount of shitboxes and fucking broken AI and just nonsensical, you press a button, input read, insta cancel, insta recovery, no fucking punish, like... I'm gonna say it here, guys, and I'm not gonna elaborate it, which is both cruel and, and, and not the best thing to do in this moment, but I think these bosses ruined Dark Souls forever. And I love them on a law grounds, and I enjoyed them when they came out casually at the time, but when it comes to mechanics, this was the start of this downward spiral into every boss is a Zell, and you're playing as like a fucking slug. And I just don't agree with it. But they're fun to watch, right? Hopefully you're enjoying watching them. And then Calamy. Calamy ended up being the best of the three. I really wanted it to be Manus, but I have to say, Calamite was the one that, he was still hard, he was still frustrating, and he still had some things I didn't agree with, but by the end of it, I learned to, to kind of appreciate him. The problem is, he has this move. <laughs> Everybody knows it. If you try to do this, you know what I'm talking about. This dude has this Beyblade spin, and unless you're really lucky and in a good place, there's no way to dodge it. So the, the answer is, is you stay close to him, and you get him to do this dance of stamping. And what happens is he'll stomp on you until he decides to do that dashing move and then the breath attack. And you want to keep on him if you can, because middle range and long range against Kalami is quite dangerous. But I quite like it, so you'll notice I'm going to use it a ton. There's a super cool loop on this boss, which you can do if you want to, where whenever he goes to stomp, if you walk under his balls and you go towards his tail and you stand behind his legs, after he recovers from the move, he'll go for a tail slam, and the tail slam is really slow, so you can move away from the tail slam and then hit his legs, and you can bait this tail slam repeatedly and just keep him super controlled. And I, I think it's fantastic, I really like it. But I didn't do it in this video because I, I didn't really want to use loops on bosses if I could avoid it. Because as impressive as they are, I want to show you the fights, you know? This is not meant to be skillful, this is not meant to be like, I'm the best in the world. It's meant to show you what these enemies can do, and how you can avoid them. Unfortunately, a lot of the enemies are really, really hard to avoid because the hitboxes are fucking terrible, and they've got bullshit moves. But, I definitely tried my best to show you some fun stuff, and this is kind of loopy right now. But that's the dash, which you can chase if you want to. There's also some interesting hitboxes on the breath there, too, if you get close to it. But we're getting a pretty good Calamite here. He's giving me some good patterns. The thing that you don't see in this recording, which I want to make known, is, is how frustrating it is when you try and hit this guy and you miss. You know how when you get under Pal and you can't hit his legs? Well, imagine that, but worse. Because I was always pretty decent at hitting Pal, whereas this guy... 
the amount of times you, you get an opportunity to punish and, and you whiff and he's got tons of HP, he's got tons of resilience, he's got all kinds of bollocks. His defense is high, like his stats are off the chart. And it's another thing, it's the reason for my... Did you see that, by the way? I went back in against this boss to double check to see whether or not when you get hit by that move it knocks you down. Because I, I thought I might have been... Like, how did I not get hit on that? I was really, really surprised. And I can confirm that that breath move does knock you down. So, I got very lucky there. I'll call it skill, but you know it wasn't. And now we're moving on to the final fight of the, the video, guys. The hardest boss in the session to record for me. Uh, this fight took a long time. It took about five hours. And it took five hours because I'm stubborn. I'm sure you're stubborn as well and you probably tried to do the same, but I thought that I could fight this guy up close. And I was really, really adamant on it because I got some really good patterns. I got some god patterns looking back. But it turns out this is just RNG the man. What he does is entirely up to him. And I've never seen a boss do so many different things consistently. It's it's almost what I imagine true randomness feels like. And I spent about two to three hours stubbornly refusing to run away from him. And I had some good success. I got him to about nearly three hits away from death. A couple of runs where I got him... There was about... In that time, I think about five runs got to the magic phase. But for the most... After the first few runs where I got really lucky and took him down a ton and thought, damn, I can do this, I just couldn't get in the fight. Every time on the opener, I, I, just, I just got hit. He did something I couldn't deal with with the option I tried. And, you know, you try running to his left, it works until it doesn't work. You try running to his right, it works until it doesn't work. I tried working quite close and medium to bait the jump, and he just kept doing the fucking insta-slam that everybody loves. And it, 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 was, it was bad. So... Finally, I decided, okay, game, fuck you. I'll run away from him. I'll run away from him. I'll play the poking game. It's a game I'm good at, but I was really unhappy with, with how shit the punishes were. Because, you know, you do an R2, you do an R1, you run away, you do an R2, you kite him because the room's terrible, and if you get stuck against a wall, you lose. And I, I just, I wasn't happy with my opportunities for damage. So I started to push the, the punish as much as I could. And I noticed that there's times against Manus where he just recovers and kind of cheeses you. So if that was going to happen anyway, I might as well take risks. If you want to play this safe, you want to do running R1s and you want to do one R2s and you never want to do anything more than that to extend. You'll notice I don't ever punish this as well. His full combo, whenever I punish this move, he punished me. I just could not do it. No matter what I did, he could sometimes just completely go into something that, that made me lose. So I stopped doing it. And what I noticed is you can land multiple R1s on certain moves and you can even land multiple R2s. And I think the highest damage I managed to figure out was, I think it's 1300 damage on two R2s on a certain move, but it's only a certain move and you need to know these moves or you'll lose. And it's all about spacing too. So this move here, you can, if you space it right, get two R1s on that. You can also get an R1 into an R2, but it's quite tricky to space that because it has two versions. And then this one here, you can hit this with a ton of moves because it's very slow. You can do all kinds of fun punishes on that, but you need to know it because if you hit the wrong thing, you'll get punished yourself. Because he has a mix-up. He has one that's really short and he has one that's really, really slow. And the short one is a bait, so he can hit you with the club and then start doing this, this, like, I think it's a four-hit combo. But the only real thing to note when you're running away from him is knowing the spacing of his jump. His jump has a really interesting hitbox where his feet hit you and then his hands hit you. But as long as you aren't hit by the feet, you should be absolutely fine. But you don't really get an understanding of how difficult that fight can be unless you try to do it up close and personal without getting incredibly lucky. But that is the end of the run, guys. Everything in Laudron slaughtered in one video. Thank you so much for watching, and you take care now.